prophecies about concerning the Messiah, uh, as well as rebuilding the physical temple. But he's looking beyond that. In fact, that's a major thrust of of his of his book is looking beyond just the physical to uh, spiritual restoration. And this is all going on um, about 550 years before the Messiah would physically appear on the scene at the first advent. The name Zechariah means Jehovah remembers or Yahweh remembers. Zechariah is um, both priest and prophet. We know he's a prophet because we have his book, but um, being a priest, that would make him from which tribe? Which of the 12 tribes? Levi. We looked at that last week, and Zerubbabel was not from the tribe of Levi. Levi. Uh, and he wasn't a priest. He was a governor of Judah. And of course, Jesus, not from Levi either. But he has a better priesthood. Okay. Uh, we, uh, we studied the Hag- Haggai, and he worked to encourage the completion of the temple project, rebuilding of the physical temple, um, because the, the Jews had, had started to build it, but got delayed by about 14 or 15 years because of their enemies and their um, lobbyists or counselors, as they're called in the text, with uh, King Xerxes, and they had the work stopped. Uh, so late, when, when Haggai comes on the scene, he admonishes the people. He says, hey, you're living in panel, nice paneled houses. What about God's temple? And so they, they begin that process, and they finish it in about two years. But um, now Zechariah is, is a contemporary writer of Haggai. There's some overlap in their in their prophetic ministries, and he's concerned about rebuilding the temple, but his vision goes far beyond that into the, the temple that the Messiah will build, not a temple built with hands, but a temple that God will build. Uh, Jordan Fontenot gave an excellent lesson last week on the book of Zechariah, and he covered a number of the visions that are cut. There's, there's eight visions um, about the sanctuary, four messages about Zion's service, and two about Zion's savior. And he did a marvelous job of laying that out and hitting the, the, the salient points as, as he made a, um, a good presentation of it. It's a good background for what we're going to do today. So with that, <clears throat> I want you to think about... Um, Zechariah in terms of Messianic messages. And I'd actually thought about this before I even started the lesson. I, I said I knew there was some, some really good ones in there, uh, maybe uh, a few better or, or more than some of the other uh, books of the 12 that we had looked at. And um, while well, I came up with this list from Zechariah, uh, Christ coming in lowliness, his humanity, His rejection and betrayal for 30 pieces of silver. His being struck by the sword of the Lord. His priesthood, his kingship, his coming glory, his building the Lord's temple, his reign, and his establishment of peace and prosperity. I believe that's 10. And if you just... Look at these ten alone. There's only one individual of all of history who matches, meets all these requirements. Just one. In fact, there's there's only one who was both priest and king. So it's pointing to a unique individual in the Messiah. Uh, There's many, many more prophecies of the Messiah in the Old Testament. But just from this one book alone, you've got enough to narrow it down to one individual in all of history. Jesus the Christ. The only one who fulfills this. Okay. 
from a, from a high-level view, 30,000-foot view, if you look at the book of Zechariah, I mentioned there's 14 chapters. The first eight chapters were written around 520 BC. They're focused on rebuilding the old physical temple, and they, they include a series of visions, which Jordan did an excellent job of summarizing and highlighting. Then in chapters 9 through 14, they're actually written later, about 40 years later, in around 480 BC. And their concern is not the physical rebuilding of the temple, but the ultimate building of the true temple, the church, the kingdom of Christ. So he's pointing to the future, off to the future, 500 some years down the line. All right. Yeah, and, and really, when, um, when we look at these prophecies, the only way to really understand what he's saying is to look at them with a view toward he's talking about building the true temple of God. Uh, and this is really key to understanding the whole prophecy, uh, as we'll see. Okay, I, I'm going to let what Jordan's work did build most of the, the first eight chapters in those visions. There's, there's simply too much for us to get through to try and go through each, each one. So I'm just going to pick a salient point in chapter 6, verse 13 and 14. Then say to him, thus says the Lord of hosts, Behold, a man whose name is Branch, for he will branch out from where he is, and he will build the temple of the Lord. Yes, it is he who will build the temple of the Lord, and he who will bear the honor and sit and rule on his throne. Thus, he will be a priest on his throne, and the council of peace will be between the two offices. The branch. That's a term used in the Old Testament for the Messiah. Um, it's referenced by Jeremiah in the 23rd chapter. It says, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch, and he will reign as king and act wisely and do justice and righteousness in the land. Jeremiah chapter 23 and verse 5. And I have a note here that uh, he will build the temple. Um, if you look at the words of Jesus in Matthew chapter 16, verse 16 through 18, uh, he had just asked, I believe it's Peter, whom, whom do you say that I am? And uh, Peter's response was, Thou art the Christ, Son of the living God. And Jesus' response was, On this rock, this fact of information that you just said, I will establish my kingdom, and the gates of hate shall not prevail against it. It will be an everlasting kingdom. It's the only one of all the kingdoms throughout all of history. They've all faded away, save one. Of course, the ones that are currently there, but they're, they're temporary, except for one. The kingdom of Christ. Uh, from chapter 7, I particularly like this verse because... It's up on the screen, but if, if you got one of these handouts at any point during the, the 12 weeks we've had, um, at the top of it, it says, true justice, kindness, and compassion. That was the theme, that, the subtitle, the name of the class, or the name of the class. And it's right here in these verses, so I just want to share it with you. Then the word of the Lord came to Zechariah, saying, thus says the Lord of hosts, Dispense true justice and practice kindness and compassion each to his brother. And do not oppress the widow or the orphan, the stranger or the poor, and do not devise evil in your hearts against one another. That's from Zechariah chapter 7, verses 8 through 10. Now, interestingly enough, it goes on from there, which I didn't put on the screen, but it says, but, <laughs> you know what that means. 
It says, but they refused to pay attention and turned a stubborn shoulder and stopped up their ears from hearing. They made their hearts like flint that, so that they could not hear the law and the words which the Lord of hosts had sent by his spirit through the former prophets. Therefore, a great wrath came from the Lord of hosts because they had refused to pay attention. Okay. I really want to focus on the last six chapters of the book of Zechariah this morning. Let's just see. Okay. And they're really in two sections. Chapters 9, 10, and 11. And then the last three. But um, Chapter 9 is really a picture of Zion's coming king. Chapter 10 is about the cornerstone. And chapter 11 is a parable of the shepherds. Let's see. And, and back to chapter 9 now. To focus on chapter 9 a little bit. Zechariah is forecasting a struggle that Judah is going to have with Greece. As in Alexander the Great, Greece. Because he's, he, Alexander, is going to end up invading Palestine in his quest for world domination. And um, in chapter 9, it actually delineates the cities in the order that they were taken or toppled by Alexander the Great. However, Jerusalem was spared. We also, in chapter 9, get a marvelous glimpse of the Messiah's triumphal entry into Jerusalem, which I'm sure you're familiar with, or will be when we're finished. Uh, chapter 10 is about the cornerstone, and um, one particular verse says, I have redeemed them, I will bring them back. You know, that kind of summarizes the, the whole 66 books of the Bible. is about man's fall from the garden. And then you've got all these chapters, and over in Revelation, God gets them back, at least a remnant back. But in between, it describes the process of how God accomplishes that. And it's on a whosoever will basis. That's the wonderful news. Uh, chapter 11 uh, is a parable of shepherds, the doom flock, a true shepherd, and worthless shepherds. You recognize this scene? The triumphal entry. It, it's obviously a drawing. There's no pictures. There's no Polaroids, as I like to say. There's no Polaroids with the little film you used to smear on there, so they didn't overdevelop. My first camera, probably in the late 60s. Uh, so this is obviously a drawing, but it, it's probably pretty recognizable. Uh, it's, it's based on Zechariah chapter 9 and verse 9. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout in triumph, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and endowed with salvation, humble and mounted on a donkey, even on a colt, the foal of a donkey. This seems to be a bit of a, an oxymoron here. Self-contained contradiction. A king, think about it, a king. How does a king arrive? A king is stately. He arrives on a steed. A big white one. Like one of those Clydesdale, you know, the hoofs are this big. You see them on the, on the commercials around Christmas time. They're enormous. That's what you'd expect a king to be on, right? Not this king. He comes in humility, riding on the foal of a colt, a donkey. Okay, but what's more remarkable than that is 
that has been prophesied 500 years before it happened. Without exception, the four Gospels present this as a prophecy of the triumphal entry of Christ into Jerusalem. All four of the Gospels reference Zechariah 9.9. And of course that happens on the Sunday of the Passion Week. Christ's last week as he comes into Jerusalem. And you remember what was happening? The people were out in front of them and they were laying down palm branches. And they were shouting something. What were they shouting? Hosanna! Hosanna! Hosanna to the king! Luke, the good physician, records a very interesting facet of this particular event in, in Luke 19 and verse 40. He says that while the people were shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna, some of the Pharisees asked Jesus to tell his people to be quiet. And Jesus had a, a very interesting response one that I'll never forget. He said, I tell you the truth, if I tell these to be quiet, the very stones, the rocks will cry out. Let that settle in a minute. There's a, um, a Christian singer named Ron Canoli, I believe is the pronunciation. And he he wrote and performed a song, and it's called, I'm not going to let a rock outpraise me. And it's based on Luke 19.40. And uh, you can take that how you want, that the very stones will cry out, but a lot of power behind those words. Also in chapter 9, there's a verse I want to point out to you, a couple, a couple down in verse 12. Return to the stronghold, O prisoners who have the hope. This very day I am declaring that I will restore you double. I will render double. This speaks of the rich reward of those who suffer shame or hardship for the work of God. Jesus made a very similar statement. James makes a statement that blessed are those who suffer for, 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 the, for righteousness sake. Okay? It's, that's the words of Jesus. Uh, Isaiah says a similar thing. Uh, he says, instead of your shame you will have double, and instead of dishonor, ye shall rejoice. They shall rejoice in their portion. So take heart in that when you're persecuted, for righteousness sake. For rich is your reward. Chapter 10 about the cornerstone. My anger is kindled against the shepherds. I will punish the male goats. For the Lord of hosts has visited his flock and the house of Judah and will make them like his majestic horse in battle. For I will come, oh, I'm sorry, from them will come the cornerstone, from them the tent peg, from them the bow of battle, from them the ruler, all of them together. Zechariah 10. Uh, three and four. This is about the complete redemption of the people of God. He mentions the cornerstone is going to come from Judah. It's the Messiah. It's Christ. And he says, this is a tent peg. This is something you can anchor to. It, when you when you, pitch, when you pitch a tent, you're looking for a, um, a spot that, that will hold a good bit of uh, force because you don't want it to uproot when the wind blows your tent or, and the rains are coming. You don't want the tent to come down. So you're looking for a, a firm place 
to put in a tent peg. And if you, I'll give you a clue. If you can push it in with your hand all the way, it's not very firm. Okay? And some of the sand you know, around southeast Texas, sandy soil is, is like that. And so what you really want is something with some clay, something that's harder and it's firmer, and you have to pound it in with a hammer. Now you've got something you can hang something on. Okay? That's, what, that's what he's saying here. This, uh, a cornerstone, you all know what a cornerstone is. You build a bridge or an archway, an archway in a building, and it's, it's an arch like this. A semicircle, half a circle. At the top, you've got brick, 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 they're square, and at the top, to make it fit, you've got to have one that's angled like a V like that. Okay? That's the cornerstone. The whole thing doesn't work without the cornerstone, because what the cornerstone does is it puts all the weight, it shifts it to each side of the arch, rather than just punching. If you had a straight one, it would just punch straight, straight through. It wouldn't hold. But a cornerstone, or a capstone, is the key to holding everything up. Okay? If you don't know about architecture and what a corner or capstone is, it's absolutely essential for, it, it, you have a bridge, a bridge span, it's got, it's got a cornerstone in it, anything with an arch has to have a cornerstone, or it's not going to, it's not going to hold up, it's not going to hold weight. Okay? And of course, Zion will, will tr ultimately triumph through the Messiah. Okay, this, this particular period here that Zechariah is writing about, uh, in chapter 9, 10, 11, and so forth, all the way through, it is not a chapter that's really primarily about the intertestamental period. It's, but rather, it's, it's looking beyond that to the establishment of the church and the kingdom of Christ. Let's see if there's anything else. Chapter 11. Parable of the shepherds. The key to the whole chapter is in verse 12, where it mentions specifically 30 pieces of silver are, are to be to get given for, for the price of the Messiah. And again, this is written 500 years-ish before the event, so it's quite remarkable. But that's the key to the whole understanding of it. Um, this is a sudden shift from uh, chapters 9 and 10. It's a shocking contrast, but actually, some critics will say, well, it doesn't fit. This couldn't be really the same writer. But if you think about it, Jesus used these kind of contrasts all the time. He would talk about the kingdom of heaven, and he would talk about hell, and he could alternate back and forth. He was very comfortable using that. It's the same kind of a technique. Zechariah talks about the coming kingdom, and then he talks about some negative things, sandwiched in. Uh, yep, let me share here. Okay. Uh, it, this, this section introduces the concept of false shepherds. Okay. The false shepherds are going to reject the true shepherd. The true shepherd being the Messiah, Christ Jesus. The false shepherds are, are really all those who reject the Messiah and his rule. Now, in Zechariah's day, that would have been the reigning Levitical priesthood. Caiaphas, Ananias, I'm moving forward to 30, 33 A.D., where they had their, their, high, their high tribunal trials of Jesus. Caiaphas was the, was, was the puppet head priest. I think Ananias was really the, the guy calling the shots behind the scenes, but he had been deposed by the Romans for murder. Um, so his son-in-law, Caiaphas, was actually sitting in the seat and wearing the hat of the high priest, although his father-in-law was still kind of the puppet master, but, but they were both of the Levitical priesthood and had both rejected Jesus as Messiah. False shepherds. Okay, false shepherds. In this process, in 
in this chapter, there, there's, there's two covenants that are broken. One's called favor, like I, I favor vanilla ice cream. I favor, I, I prefer, I favor, and union. Um, these, these covenants are actually broken in this chapter. Thus, the, the, the picture that I've got up there, the, the breaking of a covenant, the unfaithfulness of God's chosen people have, have, have ended up resulting in a breakage of the covenant of God's providential protection. His providential protection that went with that. Because the worthless shepherds preferred that over the true shepherd. And they did it for a price of 30 pieces of silver. This chapter will also um, talk about the destruction of the second temple and the rejection of the Messiah. Uh, there's one verse that I did reference in here from Acts chapter 20, uh, 29 and 30. It says, I know that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock, and from among your own selves men will arise, speaking perverse things to draw men after themselves. Worthless shepherds. Uh-oh. We're still in chapter 11 here. Uh, I want to read a summary of a couple things. Well, first, let's talk about the, the 30 pieces of silver, because that's a really interesting observation. We just mentioned that. And um, it actually says that this amount would be weighed out, which Judas actually ended up fulfilling, 30, 33 AD, uh, but was prophesied by Zechariah. Zechariah also said, prophesied, that it would be thrown into the house of the Lord, which Judas did. He had remorse, and he went back to the temple and threw the money back into the temple. That actually happened. And the Pharisees, the high priests that were in the temple, when the money was thrown there, were unwilling to put it into the treasury because it was blood money. They knew it was blood money. Said, oh no, we couldn't, it couldn't go in it. We couldn't do something like put it in the, in the treasury with it. So we'll go and purchase the potter's field. As if somehow that absolved themselves of their guilt. What's interesting about this is there's not any other record in, in Roman history of a transaction followed in this detail through four different specific events. The specific amount being thrown back in the temple, refused to put it in the treasury, and buying a potter's field with it. This is really a detailed, very highly detailed, descriptive, prophetic statement made hundreds of years before its occurrence. Now I've got a couple, a couple summaries of uh, Zechariah 11, 4 through 14. The punishment falls upon the people of Israel because they rejected the good shepherd. And then a summary of Zechariah 11, 15 through 17. In retribution for the rejection of the good shepherd, the people are given over to foolish shepherds who shall destroy them but shall himself in turn perish miserably. Did you ever think about where they got the price for 30 pieces of silver? There may have been some bartering, some haggling between Judas and the high priest. But the reality is they settled on 30 pieces, didn't they? That's a well-established well fact. Interestingly enough, in Exodus 21 and 32, chapter 21, verse 32, this is what it says. 
if a gawk, if an ox gores a male or female slave, the owner shall give his or her master thirty shekels of silver. Okay, if your ox, if you have an ox, and it gores somebody else, you know what that means? It's not good. They probably didn't live. So the price of the male or female slave was thirty shekels of silver. Now think of it. The Son of God betrayed for the price of a slave. Is that prophetic? Is that pathetic? Both. It's both. But there's more to that verse in Exodus. The rest of the verse says, "And the ox shall be stoned." It means they're going to put the ox to death. They're going to put him down because he gored somebody. Like if if we have a a dog that attacks people and mauls them, you put the dog down. Okay. Probably based on this scripture right here. I don't think what the the high priesthood realized was <clears throat> that in in their accepting thirty pieces of silver or the price of a slave for Jesus, that they were the ones that were going to get stoned. In turn, they shall perish miserably. You have to wait for this. It kind of flows in. And just so you don't think I'm too clever in these PowerPoint slides, I don't really know how that I make that happen. Instead of it just coming all at the once, sometimes part of it comes up and then it, and it writes it. You can see it writing it out. Somewhere I hit a button and it just does it. I don't know. So, in full disclosure, uh, chapter 12, morning in the house of David. Let's see. Maybe I hit this again. Here it is. Yeah. Chapter 13. We're looking at the next, the last three chapters. Okay. We're just sort of summarizing. The sword of the Lord. Where's Marty Miller? This is for you. The sword of the Lord will strike the true shepherd. Okay. That's chapter 13. And chapter 14 is about. Uh, I've summarized it. The New Jerusalem. The New Jerusalem. So these three chapters, collectively, I would say, are a vision about Israel's future, not their inner testament immediate future, but their distant future from Zechariah's point of writing. If he's writing around 500 B.C. plus or minus 20 years on either side, this is probably 480. He's talking about something that's going to happen 500 years into the future. Okay, will be the ultimate fulfillment. Now, he never literally saw that fulfillment, did he? Nobody there did. But we can look back through the lens of, of time, and we can see what it is. It's, it's clearer for us now. So it's it's um, that's a benefit to us. All right, let's look at uh, chapter 12 in a little more. Pick up a salient point. <clears throat> My favorite verse from chapter 12. See, I only get to pick one or two, so.、Um, This would have been my pick before I did the lesson.、Uh, I will pour out on the house of David and on its, the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication, so that they will look upon me, whom they have pierced, and they will mourn for him, as one mourns for an only son, and they will weep bitterly over him, like the bitter weeping. Over a firstborn, Zechariah 12 and 10. This verse is referenced in John chapter 19, verse 37. This very verse, <clears throat> which tells me that John, who was a Jew, he got the connection. Between what Zechariah said 500 years earlier, you you will look upon me whom you have pierced as he's looking at his savior and Lord being crucified. 
you will look upon me whom you have pierced. The interesting part about that, this statement in Zechariah is made by Jehovah God. You will look upon me whom you have pierced. There's clear linkage of deity between this statement and what John is observing when Jesus is crucified. He's pierced on the cross. It's, it's Jehovah. Okay. Spirit of grace and supplication. This is a reference to the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Uh, Jesus' second covenant that in his blood there shall be forgiveness of sin, no longer the blood of goats and bulls, which has to be redeemed continually, but by the precious blood of the Lamb of God, which just one drop wipes away all sin for eternity. The most powerful blood ever. They will... They will mourn for him. I want to look at that. Uh, to me, when I look at this, there's three, there's three. Three classes of mourners. In Revelation um, chapter 1, verse 7, uh, Jesus announces that he's going to come back in the clouds and all the people of the earth will see him coming, even they who pierced him upon the second advent. Even they who pierced him will see his return. The second class of people, of mourners, is in Matthew chapter 24, verse 30, which is Jesus' dissertation, explanation upon end, the end times. And there he says, when he comes back in the clouds, he says, all tribes of the earth will see him and mourn. They're going to mourn. And finally, in Revelation 6.15, it says the unbelievers and unrepentant will see him and mourn. Not only will they mourn, their statement will be, <clears throat> they'll call out to the rocks and the mountains and say, fall on us and cover us from the face of of the Lamb, for who can stand before his wrath? They're going to mourn. That's pretty desperate when you're calling out to the rocks and the mountains to fall on you and cover you. So this is an enormously prophetic statement here in the 12th chapter. It even, it even points out a portion of this, this, the specificity of the type of death in being pierced. Which, by the way, this crucifixion hadn't even been invented yet. They knew a lot of terrible things, but the Romans perfected that, I guess. Chapter 13. Sword of the Lord. In that day a fountain shall be opened for the house of David and for the inhabitants of Jerusalem, for sin and for uncleanness. Awake, O sword, against my shepherd, against the man who is my companion, says the Lord of hosts. Strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. Then I shall turn my hand against, upon, uh, it says against the little ones. A lot of translations say on the little ones, because that confused me, on the little ones. So it, it made a difference, but... We'll have, to, we'll have to save that for later, that, uh, that whole explanation. But um, obviously a fountain being open. Um, there's a fountain of living water that John talks about, uh, ta Jesus talks about in John chapter 7, 37. He who believes in me, living waters will flow out of him. Living waters, okay? A fountain being the blood of Christ. It's the only place to get your sins washed away. The only place. Okay, Zechariah 14, um, the New Jerusalem. I just selected some verses and, and just, just, just listen to them. Uh, then the Lord, my God, will come with all his holy ones with him. 
And in that day, living waters will flow out of Jerusalem. People will live in it. There will no longer be a curse, for Jerusalem will dwell in security. There will no longer be a Canaanite in the house of the Lord of hosts in that day. This is a description of the new Jerusalem. We talked about the living waters, no longer be a curse. Those things at Revelation 22, it says, the river of the water of life. There's 12 trees planted by it that yield their fruit each month for the healing of the nations. No longer any curse. In fact, the Lord himself will be the sunlight. There won't be any darkness anymore. There won't be a need for a gate. There won't be any unclean, unpure in it. And if you look at this last one, no Canaanite. What the word Canaanite means is, it means trafficker. Trafficker. Okay? And it really stands for the wicked, profane, and idolatrous people. And if you look over in Revelation, it says, the dogs, the immoral, the impure, shall not enter shall not enter. Those who are in shall dwell securely and be with their God. He shall be their God and they shall be his people. But this is a picture of the new, the new Jerusalem. And just to wrap up, application. A couple of questions for you to reflect upon. Number one, do you think there's an, aspo- an apostate church today? Zechariah was writing about it, said those worthless shepherds. Is it possible that that's still going on to this day? I see some affirmations. I would say absolutely. It is going on. Uh, Number two, how can I know that I'm following the true shepherd, not the worthless shepherd? Okay? In God's word, there's there's plenty of, of clues, shall we say, to follow. We need to make sure we're on that right path. Um, and number three, am, am I part of the new Israel in covenant with God? The new Israel, the future Israel that Zechariah was talking about and promising that was 500 years from his day. Okay? The fountain's now been opened and made available to whosoever will come. And the third one, which really, really underscores Zechariah's purpose of writing uh, those last, or, or his, his, really his whole book, was, what am I doing to stay spiritually renewed? Okay? We just don't have to get spiritually renewed. We've got to stay there. And it's an ongoing process that requires attention, forethought, and purpose to be there. That's my, that's my understanding. That's, how, that's what I've experienced. It doesn't happen by itself. It's not a once and done, check the box, and go on to the rest of everything else in life. That becomes the focus of life. And with that, I think we are out of time. So next week we'll look at uh, Malachi, but before you go, next weekend maybe a little lighter on on, uh, attendance, I just wanted to, to take a moment and thank each of you for your, your kindness and generosity in attending the class and encouraging me along the way. This has been a, a great walk together and I, I, I covet your input, your prayers, your attendance, and your support. Thank you so much. God bless.